Our second speaker is Dr. Craig Bankman, who is professor and Barry chair in the Department of Zoology, Zoology and Physiology at the University of Wyoming. Before Craig came to Wyoming in 2004, he was on the biology faculty at New Mexico State University. Uh, he was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. He completed his MS at Northern Arizona University, his PhD at SUNY Albany. Craig has held postdoctoral fellowships at Princeton University and my own alma mater, the University of British Columbia. Craig has served on several editorial boards, including the Board of Evolution and the American Naturalist. He has published over 80 papers and has research interests in the ecology and evolution of species interactions and the diversification of crossbills. Um, now, I also learned some things about Craig yesterday coming up on the plane. He hails from the San Francisco Bay Area. He is uh, into hiking and he is a photographer especially of flowers. And today, Craig is going to talk to us um, on pines and crossbill birds evolving together into new species. So please welcome Professor Craig Bankman. Well, thank you, Peter. It's really a, a privilege to be here, and uh, I'm glad everybody came. Um, like Jake, and actually I really enjoyed Jake's talk. I always enjoy listening to Jake. He always has great stories. Um, like Jake, I'm interested in species interactions. I'm interested in how these interactions cause species to evolve, and one of the processes that I'm especially interested in is called coevolution, and that's basically the reciprocal evolution of these, of these species. And so how one species exerts natural selection on another species, that species then evolves in response <coughs> to that selection, then alters the form of selection exerted on the original species, which in turn then evolves and they continue to evolve in some, some path. And then what I'm also interested in is how those interactions influence diversification. How does that influence the, the generation of new, new species and, and the diversity of life that we see on Earth? And like many things in evolutionary biology, basically Charles Darwin already spoke about it or wrote about it back in the 1800s. And he spent a lot of time in, in the origin of species talking about competitive interactions um, and predatory interactions, as well as mutualisms. And the one interaction for which he described coevolution was in pollination. And pollination, actually, in the case of bumblebees, he called them uh, humblebees, and then honeybees, which he called hive bees, in relationship to red, uh, red clover. And what he noticed was that bumblebees had a proboscis that allowed them to pollinate or gather nectar and pollinate uh, red clover quite efficiently. High honeybees didn't have that proboscis to do it. They were very inefficient at gathering nectar and they weren't effective pollinators. But then he just basically went through a thought experiment in the origin of species and thought, well, what, what if the food plants for the honeybees started to decline? He could then envision that those, those honeybees that had a proboscis that allowed them to get some nectar and pollinate some of the plants would be favored. And that would cause a shift in that population. And then he further envisioned what would happen if the bumblebees started to decline and went extinct. The result of that would be that presumably the red clover, the ones that, the, the plants of red clover that had flower structures that were more efficient in allowing or more facilitating and allowing the honeybees to gather nectar and to pollinate them, they would be favored, and then they would evolve in tandem. And then he wrote in The Origin of Species, thus I can understand how a flower and a bee might slowly become either simultaneously or one after the other, modified and adapted in the most perfect manner to each other by the continued preservation of individuals presenting mutual and slightly favorable deviations of structure. That's coevolution. So he was the first person to ever describe or talk about coevolution. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going over coevolution in this talk. And it turns out that since Darwin published his book in 1859, so over 150 years later, we've increasingly recognized that species interactions, just like Darwin, and coevolution are very important processes in the diversification of life on Earth. And what we see here is plant diversity of the number of plant species over the last 400 million years. And also on here, we have different kind of species interaction events from when they originated. 
And we can see that angiosperms, so our flowering plants, orchids, sunflowers, uh, grasses, um, oak trees, uh, they evolved around 100, 100 million years ago, and they've rapidly diversified. And much of this diversification is thought to be due to species interactions. For example, pollination, seed dispersal, herbivory. And an example of it is concerns uh, herbivorous or phytophagous beetles. And this shows the number of beetle genera, so just the taxonomic level above species, and the hatch parts of the histogram represent the herbivorous beetles. And you can see in the tertiary, so in the last 60 million years or so, there's been a large increase until very recent in the number of species of beetles. The tens to hundreds of thousands of beetles. And a recent paper, a relatively recent, in 1998 by Brian Farrell, he showed that there's been a 170-fold increase in the number of beetle species associated with a shift to feeding on flowering plants. So basically, as these flowering plants diversified, so did the beetles. And not only that, we suspect that the diversification of plants might have in part been due to the, the herbivory of the beetles. And so it's just kind of these interactions that are con mutually contributing. These are the patterns and it's suggestive. But what, I want, what I'm interested in, in terms of my research, is I'm interested in understanding what, what underlies this diversity, in this case, conifer cones or conifers. Um, and I'm especially interested in being more trained as an ornithologist, and I just like watching behavior and like watching birds, um, is understanding how the interactions between crossbills and conifers have influenced the evolution of conifers, but also the diversification of, of these crossbills. And just to give you some background, crossbills are in a group of finches called cargilline finches, um, and these are four species that are common, in, in the, for example, in the Bighorn Mountains. I was just outside, and if you look at the salt block, there is a big moose going there. But if you see a little dicky bird, a little reddish-looking bird, it's the Cassin's finch that's going down to the salt block right now. Um, but there's a group of, of these cargilline finches. Again, you're probably familiar. And cr there's two groups of, of crossbills. There are the, what I call the wing-barred crossbills. There's three species of them. There's a two-barred crossbill that occur in the large forests across uh, northern Eurasia. There's the white winged crossbill, which occurs in the northern boreal forests of North America from Alaska to Newfoundland. And they come down into more of the northwestern part of Wyoming in the Yellowstone Teton area. Tetons are actually a fairly good area to see them. And then the Hispaniolan crossbill, lo and behold, is a, actually on the island of Hispaniola in two small little mountain ranges in the pine forests there. Three very distinct forms in terms of genetics and, and distributions. They all look kind of similar. They have wing bars, and they're reddish, and their bills are funny. And then we have the red and common crossbills. The red cross, they call them red crossbills in the new world. And if you go to the old world, they call them cro uh, common, common crossbills. And they're much more diverse in, in morphology and so forth, and, and also in wider distribution. You have birds like the parrot crossbill, the, the largest billed crossbill in the world, a massive billed bird that occurs up in uh, Scandinavia and east to, uh, 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 east to the Ural Mountains. Um, and you see here these different numbers. And these, uh, this paper, this was a book uh, in 1972 by Ian Newton. And it showed what we thought were subspecies of crossbills. But it turns out that we have these call types. So we have multiple call types that will occur in one area. And I'll show you in a moment that there's two call types right in these mountains in this area that you can commonly hear and see, and they often breed in the same location. You go in uh, places, let's say, actually Jackson, uh, uh, Jackson area, the, the, the Grand Teton area, you can find three, four call types breeding in the same areas along, along with white wing crossbills. So you can have a high diver local diversity. But there's crossbills. There's one found only on Newfoundland. Uh, they go all the way down to Nicaragua. Uh, you can find them down in sou southern Vietnam and the Philippines. Uh, there's two forms in the Himalayas. There's one found only on Cyprus. There's one found only on Corsica, Majorca. There's one found, um, actually doesn't show here, but there's one in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. There's one only found in uh, Scotland. And then you can find multiple forms again in these other areas. And there's, again, this tremendous diversity. And most of these appear to be species. We're doing genetic work on them in the last uh, 
a couple of months, we can show now that they look like they're all species. Did you have a? Can I throw in you know, one question? What's the evolutionary advantage of having crossbreeding? I will um, give, yeah, I'll give him a, a couple slides. I'm not quite in sequence with Jake. I, um, but uh, give me, uh, I'll, I'll get to the why I had a crossbill. It wasn't just flying into a wall or something. Um, but this is these call types. So that's a, a what we call, uh, was designated, the person that did it, Jeff Roth, when he was doing his PhD, he was going out and he basically recorded them. And as he found a new vocalization, he'd call it one, <laughs> very creative, and then two, and <laughs> guessing the three. And, kind of, and so he called, but it, it turns out the type two is associated with ponderosa pine. So if you go a little lower, you go to the Black Hills, that's the crossbill. Um, if you are up here in the lodgepole pine forest, listen here, it's more of a ringing call. Uh, kind of a more metallic, this isn't a great recording, but that's, so if you're an ornithologist and you're good with your ear, if you, or if you, play, if you play bass, you should probably be able to pick this up <laughs> and recognize it. Actually, some of the very best uh, field ornithologists for their ear are usually musicians because they're, they're in tune with it. But anyway, this is the red uh, type two, and we're going to quiz in the end, and this is the lodge bulb. And you can, so if I can tell them apart, you can tell them apart. But these guys, are so similar, you can't tell them apart in the hand. The only way you can, get them, you can tell them is often when they call. So why do they have a cross bill? Well, they use their bill to bite between those woody scales to form a gap. And let's say if your bill was straight and you bit hard at the tip of the bill, it would shear off the tip of the bill. Think of if your teeth stuck straight out and you bit hard on something. You would just break off the tip of your teeth. You get these shearing forces. But by having decurvature, or kind of opposing teeth, but the decurvature of the upper and lower mandible in biting, those forces, instead of being shearing forces, are compression forces. It allows you to exert and withstand much greater biting forces. And that's the reason they have cross mandible, mandibles, and that's because they feed on these hard woody scales. <laughs> it turns out, when crossbills forage on a comb, this is what they do is they, they laterally abduct the lower mandible to the side to spread the scales apart. So their power motion is to the side. They bite, well that's one power, and then they abduct the mandible to this side. The muscles on this side of the skull are larger than on that side to allow them to pull and spread the scales apart to expose the seed. But you can see, if you have this asymmetry, the lower mandible curves to the right, they always orient. This bird is right mandibled, lower mandibled. It will always orient and forage on this side of the cone. And so if you came to a cone, and there's limited number of perch sites, and I, my mandible crossing is like this. I'd always forge in this side of the cone. But if there's limited number of perches, it would best to be a rare morph. Because if you follow somebody, you want to follow somebody of the opposite crossing. So I did experiments years ago. I'd put a bird in of one crossing, and then I let it feed on 10 seeds, and I'd pull it out, and then I'd throw in another. I went, I let in another bird <laughs> of either the same or an opposite crossing. And if you let in a bird of the opposite crossing, it had a there was no depression in feeding rate. But if it followed one of its own crossing, there was a significant deep depression in feeding rate. So what you expect is it's basically a frequency dependence. The, the more common you are, the greater the disadvantage. And you'd expect it to equilibrate about one to one like sex ratios. And that's why we have a one to one sex ratio because if there's a rare sex and you have a cho choice, let's say if there's very few females out in the population and your parents, you should produce females because you're gonna have a your offspring will have a tremendous reproductive advantage. The same thing with the mandible crossing <coughs> is that it looks like it's just one-to-one -one because the rare form would have an advantage. But it turns out the white wing crossbill doesn't orient to the cone. It tears all the cones off because they're small. It orients to its, the cone to itself. And there's no advantage, and they, they're three-to-one. And then 500,000 years ago, that white wing crossbill flew down to Hispaniola where it feeds on a big pine cone like our ponderosa pine, and it's shifted now to a one-to-one. -one because they can't twist the cone. So it looks like, anyway, a long story to the, that. But anyway, this is um, showing a crossbill forging on a cone. You can see it laterally abducts the lower mandible to the side, spreading the scales apart. And you can imagine that the thicker the scales, the harder it is to pull them apart or spread them apart. And so that would be a defense of the tree. Then the tongue, they have a very long tongue, like a woodpecker or a, a hummingbird. And they have a long hyoid apparatus that wraps around the back of the skull, allows them to reach the tongue way down. And you can see it probing. They're trying to spread the scale. And once the scales are far enough apart that they can lift the seed out, they lift the seed out, and then they husk the seed. They remove the seed coat. 
And then they swallow the kernel, and they do this hundreds to thousands of times a day, depending on the size of the seed. So cone scales influence the birds. But also, this is, these are little guys. These are the smallest of the crossbills in, North, in the New World. And they're feeding on little hemlock cones. And every time they're lifting their head, they're husking a seed. They're very quick. And why I want to show you this is there's going to be a big billed bird in a moment. And you'll see how slow it is on these little cones. So here's a big billed bird. And he's trying as hard as he can. And, but you can see it takes longer to husk the seeds. And it takes longer for him to get seeds from the cones. So bill size influences the accessibility of the seeds. Cone scale structure influences the accessibility of the seeds. That's kind of the interface of this interaction. And so I got to know if I can get this to stop, because you're just going to watch that. I'm going to get on like this so you can't see it. <laughs> so the, the, in terms of the data, what I wanted to show you is you can gather data to see how bill size, in this case, bill depth, how deep the bill is, influences the time, influences the time to extract seeds. You already saw it. This is just quantifying. So these are individual birds. And you can see as bill size changes, the efficiency, efficiency changes. And you can solve for what's the optimal bill for a given cone size in terms of meeting your daily energy demands. You can just <coughs> simple math. Anyway, so I gather lots of those data. But it's not just cone size that's important. It's also seed size. There's ponderosa pine seeds and there's lodgepole pine seeds. They differ greatly in bill size. And it turns out cardioline finches like crossbills. They husk seeds in a very stereotypic way. This is a cross-section of the upper mandible, the lower mandible, just cut. And what they do is they secure a seed in the lateral groove, in a groove in the la a, a lateral groove of the upper mandible. It's in the palate. They use their tongue to secure it. Then they use the lower mandible to crack the seed coat. Then they use the lower mandible and the tongue to remove the seed coat, discard it, and then swallow the seed. You saw it in the video. You couldn't see all that detail. But what you might think is there's some overall functional relationship between the width of that groove and the size of the seed. So if you eat big seeds, you want to have big wide grooves, and small seeds, you have small grooves. And then the crossbills have these funny crossings. And so it means that they only can husk seeds on one side of the, of the bill. This bird's cross mandible, lower mandible crosses to its right, and so she holds the seed on the left side, and you can see her tongue securing it there, the ponderosa pine seed. So then the question is, how do you measure the width of the groove? Well, I was actually at UBC at the time, and they have a dental school. So I went to the <laughs> dental school and said, gosh, do you have that material that you use to make tooth molds? And it says epoxy material, and you just take it, you make it a little ball, and you get, they give you tongue depressors as well. Crossbills are very tame. That's why I started working on them almost. They're really easy to work with. You say, ah, very smart. <laughs> Open their bill, hold it up against it. Actually, it takes about a week to figure it no, out. No. You hold it up against the roof of the mouth for about two, three minutes. It hardens, and you gently remove it, and you have a mold of the palate. Then you make cross sections of it, and you can digitize it and measure the width of the groove, and then see how the width of the groove, just like bill depth, but in this case influences seed husking time. And then you can look at the combinations of beak depth and groove width, how that influences the ability to survive in relationship to feeding on these different conifers that are reliable conifers in the Rocky Mountain and the Pacific Northwest. And what, this, what you can interpret from this figure, this is what we call an adaptive surface. It's kind of like a, just a topographic map. This is like a, the Bighorn Mountains. So here's, here are the Bighorn Mountains, and then I don't know. Uh, I should have looked at my geography better. What's the, there's some, well, anyway, um, Beartooth Plateau, and then you get up in the T, you know, so forth, that kind of thing. Turns out the higher the elevation, the higher the fitness. And what theory says, and logic says, is that if a population's over here in this morphology, natural selection should drive the, the population to the summit. And when there's valleys between it, natural selection should drive them apart and select against intermediates. And what we find is that there's five call types, each adapted to these different conifers. And they fall, basically, and reside on top of those summits of those peaks, the morphologies. And this shows a beak depth. And actually, and this is the mean beak depth of these five call types, and they fall right fairly close. And the groove width is even better. 
So anyway, it looks like we understand kind of what's driving the morphological evolution of these different crossbills. It's basically adapting to these different conifers. They're, they're host races of crossbills, and their hosts are these different conifers. What you probably notice is lodgepole pines here twice. There's with squirrels, just like right out here, and then there's no squirrels, and there's sort of these mountain ranges without squirrels. And how it happened here is over the last five to 12,000 years, in the absence of squirrels in these ranges, we've had a co what we call a co-evolutionary arms race, which I will describe in a bit. But basically, what we call a co-evolutionary arms race between the bird and the tree, causing cones to increase their defenses against the crossbills, and crossbills to evolve greater offenses in terms of bigger bills. And as it just this move and basically this space that we are looking here, basically creating a new species because of coevolution. And so this shows the distribution of lodgepole pine here. I want to talk about this. And throughout most of the range of lodgepole, from the Yukon down to Colorado, cones look like this. And if you walk around out here and look at the cones, they look roughly like this. But if you go to mountain ranges east and west of the Rockies where there's no squirrels, the cones look like this. Greatly different. And if you go to this area, so we're over here, the bighorns, and if you enlarge that area, we have a map here. And this black area shows the distribution of lodgepole pine. And as I mentioned, throughout most of the range of lodgepole pine, red squirrels are quite common. They're all around here in the forest now. And they're superior competitors for the seeds to crossbills. And the reason they're superior competitors is they harvest the cones in the fall by the, by the bushel loads. And they bury them. There's a massive cache over there, about 150 feet, probably the size of this, um, from about 25 feet across. And they've thousands and thousands of cones. So they preemptively harvest them in the fall. And the result is crossbills are relatively uncommon in these forests because of the squirrels. Squirrels drive the evolution of the cones. And then the crossbill up here adapts to it. But the crossbills are kind of, they're pretty, they're ornaments on the tree, but they don't have much importance. So crossbills adapt to these average cones. But when the glaciers are treated, lodgepole pine moved north and colonized areas like Cypress Hills. But the Cypress Hills and other areas like the Bear's Paw and Little Rockies, and then the South Hills and the Albions, they were isolated by grasslands and sagebrush, and squirrels couldn't get there. But crossbills could. In the absence of squirrels, crossbills are 20 times more abundant. There's no competitor. In the absence of squirrels, cones lost squirrel defenses. They completely rearranged, repackaged the cones. There's, instead of 15 to 20 seeds per cone, there's about 60 seeds per cone. It's because of squirrels. But with the increasing numbers of crossbills and exerting selection on the cones, these scales have gotten a lot larger as a defense, as you saw the foraging crossbill. That's where the crossbills feed out toward the end. This favors a bigger bill size. And we find this replicated patterns of coevolution east and west. This divergence in bill size has favored divergence in songs and calls. And now these birds are completely, almost completely reproductively isolated from other crossbills. And this is all in the last few thousand years. And so what we get is basically this coevolution driving this, this new peak. But if we go back into the plant fossil record, or the pollen fossil record, to about 12,000 years ago, Ponderosa pine was only found in southeastern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico. There wasn't enough area there to support a crossbill because in many years, um, you wouldn't have any cones produced over that small of an area. Ponderosa it fluctuates a lot. You need a fairly large area, geographic area of Ponderosa to support a crossbill. South Hills, there was just a scattering of pines there, very few 12,000 years ago. But there was a fair amount of lodgepole pine. And it's a fairly stable cone producer. And so we assume there was, probably, there was undoubtedly a, a lodgepole pine crossbill 12,000 years ago. But 5,000 years ago, Rocky, uh, ponderosa pine expanded up to about this latitude. Lodgepole pine then started to expand greatly about 5,000 years ago. And that's what we assume when these birds started to evolve. And then we've looked at, uh, well, what evolutionary biologists, how they defined a species, is in terms of reproductive isolation. Is that population reproductively isolated from others so that there isn't a lot of gene flow 
basically homogenizing the population so that they can evolve, evolve independently. And so we've gone to the South Hills, or I say we, like uh, actually Julie um, Smith, a former student of mine, and quantified the levels of reproductive isolation in terms of how, how strong are these barriers. And we have three different types of barriers. One is just habitat isolation. If the cones are sufficiently different and the birds then are sufficiently different, it's hard for them to persist or survive on the alternative conifer. And so if they don't occur together at the same time when they're breeding, they can't interbreed. And that would be a form of habitat isolation. If they occur together at the same time, but one can breed, but one can't breed very well, that would be more of a temporal isolation. Let's say they had to delay the breed because the seeds hadn't increased in availability. And then finally, behavioral isolation is you're there breeding, but you breed assortatively. You breed only with your own kind. And these are measures of those. So they're pretty strong in the sense of zero is random. Everybody breeds with everybody. Panmictic, we call it. One is no gene flow. But what we really want to know is what's the total isolation here. And I'm not going to go through how you figure this out, but it's a large number relative to one. So basically it means that there's almost no gene flow between these. And this value is much greater than, than in almost every species pair we've ever looked at or people have looked at in insects and plants. So what's amazing about this is that probably in about 5,000 years in southern Idaho in the South Hills, We've had a co-evolutionary arms race between the crossbill and the tree, causing divergence in the cones. And we've gotten reproductive isolation and new species forming. And this is more reproductively isolated than any of the Darwin's finches, more than sap suckers that are called species, or, or warblers and so forth. And we actually, we've just done some genetic studies, and we can show that they are really different genetically. But it took a lot of work to do that genetically, but it's, it's, it's possible now. So. That tells you, I've talked a little bit about the crossbill part. What I want to do is talk about how do we know that the cones are evolving in response to the animals and these changes that we see? Or can we detect that? We aren't saying that all the cone evolution is due to crossbills, but can we detect a signature of it? And if you just walk around in the forest and you pick up a cone, and you pick up, let's say, you take a walk for a mile through the woods, and whenever you find a cone, you take one of them and you go on. And that's what I did last fall. I walked the Laramie Range east of, of campus, and I just took a cone from eight different trees along a trail. And I brought them back home and took a picture of them. And you see there's a lot of variation in the, these cones. And there's a lot of among tree variation and relatively little within a tree. So most of the cones on that tree look roughly like that. And squirrels and crossbills are very sensitive to this variation because their life depends upon it because the, the structure of the cone influences how fast they can get seeds from them. And if they, they can do better, or that, and that can, in turn, can certainly influence their survival. So what we do, and what I like to do, is you walk in the woods, but a little more systematically or randomly than that. And this is from a walk in the woods in, in Europe, in the French Alps. And, the, and these are mountain pine, which is a pine we've been working on mostly in the Pyrenees. And this is one tree where the crossbills have just forged on almost all the cones. And they drop them on the ground, which is very convenient. It allows you to gather them up and count them. And these were two cones I picked from the tree. I put them on the ground. And then the adjacent tree, the crossbills hadn't touched. And I put some cones on the ground there. And let's enlarge it. So this is the crossbill, the, the tree, the, the cone that the crossbills avoided. This is the one they forge on. And you can see that the scales are much bigger than the one they avoided. Remember, the thicker the scales, probably the more resistance to that lateral abduction of the crossbills. So it makes sense that they avoid these. <coughs> and it turns out what we, we do, as I've already roughly described, is we go to these areas and we count the, basically the number of cones that crossbills have forged on. I think we get binoculars out and I'll count the number of cones they haven't forged on for a given tree. And I can measure basically the amount of pre seed predation each for each tree. Then I, we gather cones and we bring them back to the lab and we measure the cone traits with the, and see what traits are these crossbills or squirrels are sensitive to. Then what we do is then we just take a relative measure of their fitness in terms of seed predation. It's one minus seed predation in effect. And so trees that have high relative fitness in relationship to crossbills are, are avoided by crossbills. Ones that have low fitness would be the ones that get eaten. And they're the ones that aren't going to have offspring. That's why they have low relative fitness. 
And then in this case, we have scale thickness, because that's the one trait in species after species of conifer we find that cross bills are influenced in terms of their foraging preferences. And so what you'd expect is, there's a red squirrel right there. <laughs> um, my nemesis at every uh, anyway, I love them, but they yeah, well. uh, Anyway, what you would expect is over time, if this is the pattern of natural selection being observed, scales should get thicker and thicker. So if you go to the Pyrenees, crossbills are very common. If you go south of the Pyrenees, it's the isolated mountain ranges in the central part of Spain where there's mountain pine, crossbills are scarce. They tend to be less common in smaller ranges. And guess what? Scales are 25% thicker where they're more common than where the crossbills are scarce. So basically we can measure selection and we can then see what's the response to the selection. And we know kind of the time course at which it occurs. And so what we find is this coevolution between crossbills and then we have the same type of data for lodgepole pine, uh, between crossbills and lodgepole pine. And so let me just kind of go over what we mean by coevolution. And so first of all, crossbills exert selection on the pine and we can show that and we've done it for lots of different species. Trees then evolve in response to that selection because these cone traits are heritable. But these changes in cone traits then influence this selection being experienced by the crossbills. This in turn favors a larger bill. And so what we mean by coevolution is reciprocal selection exerted on these two players. Each exerts selection on them and they both respond by evolving in response to that, or evolving uh, in response to that selection. So is that clear? Okay. And then if it goes over time, what you find is bills get bigger and bigger and the cones get thicker, thicker and thicker scales. And what we call that, as I mentioned, a coevolutionary arms race, just like the Cold War. <laughs> but these are between the predator and the prey. And this type of process is actually thought to be one of the most important processes in the diversification of life. But it's very actually, it turns out it's really hard to document. And with crossbills and conifers, it's actually one of the more straightforward ways of, of documenting it. Well, the question then is, you know, we find this replicated coevolution east and west of the Rockies. We can actually show genetically that these pines have evolved. Their closest ancestors are these over here, and these closest ancestors are these over here. So they've, the trees have evolved independently. And we're, Virtually certain the birds have, although we haven't done the genetics on that. Unfortunately, as the story goes, these crossbills are extinct. And they, and, uh, uh, as you can imagine, and I'll get to a, another story in a second just like this, is they introduced squirrels there in 1950. It's bad to introduce squirrels. But what we wanted to do is find out, is this, do we find this in other systems? Is it just the Rocky Mountain lodgepole pine? Or does it occur elsewhere? How common is coevolution in the diversification of crossbills? So the first place we went to was Newfoundland. 10,000 years ago, ice covered Newfoundland. 9,000 years ago, black spruce colonized Newfoundland. On the mainland, the white winged crossbill specializes on black spruce because it's a very reliable seed producer. You need a reliable seed producer to specialize. That's what characterized those other conifers in that topographic map we saw earlier. In the 9,000 years ago, I said the black spruce colonized it. Squirrels did not colonize it. Crossbills did. Crossbills and black spruce got engaged in a coevolutionary arms race. Black spruce has lost its squirrel defenses, we can show, and they've increased crossbill defenses by involving thicker scales. And so it's really remarkable. I'm not going to show you the data, but these cones have evolved in a replicated way, just like the pines have in the Cypress Hills and the South Hills. So we get whatever you kind of rewind the clock, you remove squirrels, you throw in crossbills. The same thing unwinds. Same thing plays, yes. Does the thicker scale have any effect on the reproduction of the tree? Um, the thi well, presumably what would happen is the more, mon more resources you allocate to cone, the fewer resources you can allocate to seed. So in lodgepole pine, if you gather the cones out here and you quantify the amount of co uh, cone that is seed mass versus cone mass, 99% of it is cone, 1% is seed. If you remove squirrels and you go to the South Hills or the uh, Cypress Hills without squirrels, then it's about 3%. Still not very high, but it's a tripling of it, relatively speaking. Because that's the trait that squirrels, crossbills don't care about that ratio so much, usually, except for in the very end of today. But the, uh, 
And this, at least in lodgepole pine, they don't, it's not, doesn't influence their foraging, but does for squirrels. Yes? The scales get thicker. The scales get thicker. Does there come a point where the crossbow just leaves the guy out? That's a good question. Um, Crossbills, I'm talking about how important they are. They only eat 6% of the seeds. Up to, they only eat 6% of the seeds. In other cases, we'll find them eating much higher. But in the lodgepole pine system, they've only managed to get 6%. Um, and the seeds, are, the cones are just sitting there. That's over 10 years of, of the cones sitting for 10 years on the tree. Um, as the cones get even older, they eat more and more of the seeds. But yeah, it's a, a good question. Um, there are there are a lot of uh, cones that have seeds that are greater than about 50 milligrams. Crossbills don't touch. So limber pine, they rarely feed on those. Um, and some of these massive cones, they don't touch. But I don't think it's because of crossbills. I think it's because of squirrels. But, and yes. Do you expect uh, the next evolutionary process to be for the lodgepole pine something against the beetle? And what have you seen with the crossbills since we've had that beetle problem? Okay. Um, I don't think there's going to be a risk. The, the crossbills only exert selection on the cones. And the beetles aren't, I don't think there's any, ev any relationship between beetle kill and cone structure. So I imagine it's more having to do with the phloem and the, the, the biochemistry of the phloem, maybe with the, with the beetles. Um, and then also just condition of the environmental condition of the, the tree. Um, but if you lose a lot of trees, you're going to lose a lot of crossbills. And so if we lose 50% of the lodgepole pine, we're probably going to lose, a, lose about 50% of the crossbill population. If we lose more, we'll lose even more. Yes. How did you incorporate, so in lodgepole, how did you incorporate serotonous versus non serotonous cones in all this? That's a really good uh, uh, question. Um, that's a whole lecture on that, but I'll try to be very quick. Squirrels exert strong selection against serotonin because what squirrels do is that um, they, dis they uh, disproportionately harvest serotonous cones over non serotonous So just to be clear, serotonous cones are the fire-adapted cones that stay closed until a fire, until they get warmed up, and they open and release their seeds, like the Yellowstone fire. non serotonous cones open in the fall. It turns out that if you go to the old world or the new world, may, I'm probably going to... This is the whole, I just told you it's the whole seminar. <laughs> um, squirrels run the world. Mammals run the world. I love birds, but mammals run it, unfortunately. That's what Jake has a, is the right idea of studying mammals. Um, so conifers, what they do is the seeds develop, I'm sorry? Seeds develop over the summer. Then, or actually cones develop over the summer. You get the defense in place. Then seeds in the last part of summer rapidly mature, late July, August. And then, once the cones and seeds, or the seeds mature, there's a couple week window before the cones usually begin to open, except for in serotonous <coughs> individuals. Squirrels, in effect, have reduced that window because that window of time between when the seeds mature and the cones open, that's when the squirrels cache the cones. If you go outside the range of the red squirrel, Tamia sires, go to Mexico or the Old World, cones ripen the same way, but they stay closed until November or all the way until April because there's no red squirrel harvesting the cones. At least not Tamiya sires. There's a sires, but they're very ineffective. Squirrels have also, Tamiya sires, have influenced serotonin. So if you go to these mountain ranges where there's no squirrels, over 90% of the trees are serotonous. Over 90% of the trees are serotonous. Over 90% of the trees are serotonous. Over 90%, over 90%. Here, it averages around 30% because of squirrels. Looks like squirrels. We just have a paper we just published with a graduate student of mine in Yellowstone. The best predictor of serotonin in Yellowstone is the density of squirrels. The more squirrels, the less serotonin. Because they select, because what the serotonin is, is basically you want to have an arboreal seed bank so that you can rain down your seeds after a fire. Because the great conditions and so forth, there's no competition in the soil and so forth. Squirrels remove that seed bank, so they select against it. So they favor releasing seeds in the fall. And so actually, if you have, even if you have a high fire frequency in an area, if you have a high enough density of squirrels, about two squirrels per hectare, it'll suppress and basically favor almost no serotonin in that, 
So squirrels are actually driving that variation in probably the seedling density and everything in the Yellowstone. So squirrels come raise their head, they, they mess up the crossbills and they and they uh, they do everything. But that's an, another story. Yes. Uh, do any of the seeds maintain viability through the digestive tract of the bird? No. They, that's a good question. They're they're exclusively a seed predator. They remove the seed coat, and once you do that, they're out of luck. So if they did, let's say if they, nothing else happened, the seed would just shrivel up in a couple hours and would be dead. But they're exclusively and they. Very rarely they drop a seed. I used to do experiments. When I started out to figure out, I had a, a boxes, and I'd watch them feed, and I videotaped it. No, I didn't videotape it. I, um, I just had an event recorder. But I would count the seeds, and then see how many seeds I recorded, and how many seeds were actually eaten. I pieced together all this, the holes. <coughs> and every now and then, about one out of every 500 seeds, the crossbow looked down, watch it fall. I was like, dang, one got away. And sure enough, you cut one of the seeds open. And often they'd just be empty. But there'd be one that was full. And they dropped it. But they, they're, they're a very good <coughs> seed predator. Any other? OK. Oh, OK. I didn't tell you the story. OK, we'll go back to Newfoundland. 9,000 years ago, we got this co-evolution in this new crossbow. Unfortunately, in Newfoundland, there's an endemic pine martin called the Newfoundland martin. And not the unfortunate. That's great. But unfortunately, trappers overtrapped the martin. So there are only a couple hundred left. So in 1963, the Newfoundland Wildlife Service had a really great idea. Let's introduce red squirrels onto Newfoundland, where the cones <laughs> have lost all the squirrel defenses. And these cones are up there in the tree for long periods of time, just candy. We well, thought we should introduce red squirrels because they would have to provide an increase the prey base for the martin. Well. Turns out in the boreal forest, guess what martins mostly eat? Microtus on the ground. So guess what happened when they introduced red squirrels? Well, the red squirrels took off. Within 10 years, they covered the whole island, over 100,000 100, square kilometers. Introduced them on the west coast. <coughs> guess what happened to the martins? Nothing. They haven't, they're still endangered. There's still a couple hundred martins. Guess what happened to the crossbill? Well, this is what happened to the crossbill. They were extremely common in the 60s and 50s and 40s. But within 10 years after the squirrels were introduced, crossbills plummeted. This kind of shows it's a bad idea to introduce mammals anywhere. And squirrels especially in the <laughs> forest. But this is actually, it might still persist. There's a few birds apparently coming to feeders every spring that seem to be of a distinct call. We don't know a whole lot about them. But other than from old museum specimens, they're big billed birds. Anyway, so we then got, in, as I said, we were interested. How widespread is this coevolution? Various conditions influencing it. And we went, actually, Eduardo, a postdoc, came from Spain uh, and worked on the Iberian Peninsula. And then we went to the Balearic Islands, went to Mallorca. There's an endemic crossbill here, no squirrels. And looked at the same thing, found the same result. And so if you go to islands where there's no squirrels and they've been evolving for about uh, five to 10,000 years post Pleistocene, you find that scales increase about 12 or 11 to 15 percent. So about given 10,000 years, scales will increase about 10 percent, 10, 15 percent. If you give them a little more time, you go to Cyprus. There's an endemic crossbill, no squirrels, in the Black Pine, the Trudos Mountains. Eastern Mediterranean has been more stable over the last 30, 40,000 years. You find the scales have increased 19%. <coughs> go down to Hispaniola. Here, crossbills have been evolving, co evolving with the Hispaniola and Pine in those mount two mountain ranges for about 500,000 years based on the genetic evidence for the birds as well as the trees. Scales have increased 53%. Give it a little more time, it escalates. It just escalates, it's just arms race. And so if you plot percent increase in scale thickness versus time, you find that scale th thickness gets bigger, thicker, and thicker, and thicker. Get closer to the equator, basically you haven't had ice ages interfering with it. And so, again, this is kind of schematic before. Increasing time, you get the increasing escalation of this arms race. And this brings me to the final story, which concerns 
How important is coevolution in the diversification of crossbills? I think it's important for most of the crossbills. I think it's very important for the paracrossbill, and we're working on that slowly. Um, this is a, will be a long-term project because you, just because of logistics and so forth. But the paracrossbill occurs up in the uh, Scandinavia and a little bit east into Russia. It's specialized for feeding on Scots pine. And then we have the Himalayan crossbill, the smallest crossbill in the world. It's specialized for foraging on a, a, a hemlock in the Himalayas. And so what we find is roughly before, most of the diversity you can, you can explain is they feed on different species of conifers that differ greatly in cone structure. But what's interesting is the second largest crossbill in the world and the second <coughs> smallest crossbill in the world both specialize on Pinus cassius, on the same species of pine. And this, to me, is rather intriguing. And so 72% of the variation in crossbills, the range of variation in bill size, is on one conifer. Well, where is Pinus cassia? What an excuse to go to Southeast Asia. Vietnam is in the Dalat Plateau of Vietnam is where uh, the, the Vietnamese crossbill occurs. And then in the, the Cordillera in, in Lausanne in the northern Philippines is where the Philippines crossbill occurs. Turns out if you go to Dalat, there's a lot of endemic species. There's a lot of endemic birds only found there. There's a lot of endemic mammals. There's a lot of endemic plants. And when we were out in the forest with a, a, a botanist, that was, that was like the colleague I had there, went out and wanted to show me a certain rare plant, a tree, pine, one of the weirdest pines in the world. It looked like it was a yew, but it's a pine. We were looking at it. It was just off the road up in a, a mist cloud forest. Got out of the car, 100 feet from this highway. Because, ah, that's a new species of orchid. And there's just all these new species there. Anyway, it looks like there's been a lot more time in Vietnam than in the Philippines. This shows how what's been envisioned by Miroff in terms of how these trees got where they are. So basically, this, this pine evolved from a, a Chinese pine, a, a pine from China. And um, it moved into South Vietnam, and then it moved down through Thailand, across the Sunda Shelf, and up into the Philippines more recently. So it's plausible that they had more time. If you look at the ecological studies, as well as now in the last couple of years, the pollen fossil records for the Philippines, this pine was very scarce until about 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. And the only reason it's very common in the upper elevations is because of humans. And a lot more fire, and now the pine is spread. So perhaps this Philippine crossbill's only been there for a few hundred years, and this one's probably been there for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And so we had to go there to see the pines and see if we could measure selection exerted by the crossbills and so forth on the trees and just see what, what's going on. Second tree, we went, went to three study sites in Vietnam. Second tree we got to was a tree that was just almost completely hammered by crossbills. All the cones were shredded. Never saw that in the Philippines. But it was the only tree out of a lot of trees that we were able to gather cones from which crossbills fed on. So we really couldn't measure selection. But it's not going to prevent me from telling you a little more. So scale thickness, that's the trait that I thought would differ. This is the tree that crossbills foraged on at that study site. These are all the trees they didn't forage on. There were other trees they foraged on, we just couldn't get 70 feet up in the tree when there were no lower branches. So there's no pattern. They just picked a, tr a cone with a tree with average scale thickness. And what you find is that Vietnam and Philippines do not differ in scale thickness. And actually, the Philippines have a, tend to have a thicker scale, the opposite of what we predict. Oh, man, what a drag. <laughs> Went all that way. And, uh, but then we looked at some other traits. And what's interesting is that seed mass to cone mass ratio, basically the amount of food relative to the fence, Crossbills forage on cones that have a lot of food but very little defense. That makes sense. We don't find that so much elsewhere. It looks like it occurs here. And what's also interesting is in Vietnam, there's a much lower ratio of seed mass to cone mass. So it is conceivable that if crossbills always feed on these trees and they don't reproduce, they don't have seedlings, then the trees should evolve to have less and less cone mass. And that's maybe what's going on in Vietnam if you give it enough time. 
Possibly. Well, it turns out there's another difference, squirrels. <laughs> there's three species of tree squirrels in Vietnam, and there's none in the Philippines. And the one cone trait that squirrels select consistently, location after location, is seed mass to cone mass. And this is the pattern you'd expect if squirrels are important. So what we think, or what I think is, is going on, is the combination of crossbills and squirrels are driving these cones, and this is resulting in this massive bill in Vietnam. So it's the combination of both of these players. And perhaps squirrels are, more are, are likely to be more important here. And so, the, well, I just want to end by saying that I think we can begin to understand some of this diversity in conifer cone structure. Not all of it, perhaps, but some of it in terms of how seed predators like crossbills have influenced their evolution. And in turn, that allows us to understand how the diversification of crossbills have unfolded. And these species interactions have been very critical. And coevolution has been a very important process. But there's also these other players, like mammals, that have a big impact as well. But also having these areas with and without squirrels has really helped us understand what's going on. And then finally, just some acknowledges, acknowledgments. Uh, Ed, uh, Eduardo um, Mesquita has been a great help as a colleague um, in working in the Pyrenees and in the, in, the, in the Mediterranean, as well as Cuba. I couldn't go to Cuba. He could go to Cuba as a Spaniard. Um, and then uh, Tom Parchman was involved in a lot of the lodgepole pine work. Julie was with the reproductive isolation. And Truong was just a great collaborator and continues to be a collaborator in Vietnam. And then funding, uh, including uh, the National Science Foundation in, in Bob Gary. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any more questions. When you're talking about the, uh, the red or common crossbills, and you said that there are five call types, are you, I, I'm not really up on birds, so does that mean subspecies? Okay. Um, subspecies are geographic replacements. Or so you go to the Rockies, there'd be one, and the Sierra, there'd be another, and so mm -hmm. These all co-occur throughout the range. So they're, they're call types because they can, we can recognize them by calls, by song, and the birds recognize them as different species. So they're actually, um, in 2009, I recommended that the South Hills crossbill be a species. Just wrote a paper and said, no, this should be a species. And they said, no, you need to do this and this. So we collected the type series, wound up a lot of birds. And so last fall, we did that, because now we have a nice collection of curators at the, at the Laramie. We have now genetic data that shows that they're a species. And we can actually show, as of about in the last couple months, that all the call types look like they're species, genetically. There looks like no evidence of gene flow, okay, at least not. And so we, there's 10 of them in North America. When you go through and you look at the grooves in, in, uh, in the palate, cell, yeah. is that creating a different call? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. There is an idea that. Um, Bill size, as bill size changes, as the bill gets bigger, it's harder to move it quickly. And that's part of the whole vocal track. And the smaller the bill, the more rapid the trill, and the wider, the greater the amplitude of the trill. And so the bigger the bill, basically you have a less rapid and a, a, a narrower range of amplitude. And so the idea is, as natural selection favors differences in bills, a byproduct of that is a different song, and that could lead to reproductive isolation. I have, there's evidence for that in sparrows, and some evidence in the Darwin's finches. I tended not to think much about it, because um, crossbills I don't think of of having real trills in their songs, um, until this summer. And um, we're now doing a lot of, we're starting to do a lot of work on that and we think that there actually could be something going on. The thing is about calls is that they change their calls. So if in the lab you can, you can foster raise birds and they'll call, give the call whatever their parent is. And, we, and actually they'll they change their calls over time. So when they pair up, they match their, each, their mate's call. So we have banded birds. We color band these birds for the last over 10 years in Idaho where they're resident. Most crossbills are nomadic. They're highly, they're highly sedentary, or they're sedentary, I should say. Um, and we catch them, and we often used to know their mates. And we would record them over time. And if they changed mates, you could see their changes, and they would 
in one or the other or both would change and they'd merge into the identical calls. One time we had a, a, a ponderosa pine bird come into the South Hills and paired up with a, she paired up with a male South Hills crossbill and they had very different calls. We caught the whole family of the net after they fledged the young. The next year the fa same family, though it's not the same family, the same parents, with another family came to the same net and we caught them. But the female said, you know, this guy's really good. I'm really happy with him. I'm going to change my call to be his call. So she changed from a Ponderosa or Type 2 call to a South Hills call. I think that happens very, very rarely, but they can change it. The, but there are more buzzy notes in the calls, and we're curious if something is going on. After she changed herself to stay with him, could you do a follow-up five years later to see if she's still happy? Uh, <laughs> The problem is, uh, we've mentioned, and actually this is maybe a good segue and I should, uh, for, for Indy, is that um, unfortunately the South Hills crossbow population, uh, when we started studying them in the, uh, the early 2000, we started color banding them and following actually 1998 we started, but really in 2001 when we made a big effort. The first couple of years the adult survival rate was about 70%. Nice survival rate, about average what you would find for stable population. Very common bird, I mentioned it. More common than anywhere. That's why I was studying them there. They're sedentary. And also, it's co-evolving. It's fun. Over 90% of the cones are serotonous. Crossbills feed on cones that are over six years old. They can't get the young cones. You have to let them weather. And as they weather, you get little gaps between the scales, and that's when they can start getting into them. But when you have over 90 degree temperatures in those forests, those cones, especially the older ones, appear to open. And that seed bank disappears. So the survivorship went from 70 to 45. And so between 2003 when the first heat wave, actually the heat wave was 2003, I missed, there was a heat wave in 2000, 2003 with the Europe and Glacier Park, the, we had an unprecedented number of hot summer days. We had also in 2006 and 2007. And the population declined 80% over that time period. And so the projection is for increasing hot summers and unfortunately they rely on these cones that stay closed for long periods of time. And actually, most crossbills across North America have declined by 3 to 4% per year since 1980 when heat started to go up. And it's not the same thing, but it's related. So to stay on task, unfortunately, we have to bring this part <coughs> of the program to a close. Yeah. So let's thank Craig again for a wonderful talk. <laughs> I